All right, thank you. Uh, we're back after break, continuing our testimony related to the Kern Hatton School update. And our next witness is Kim Dougherty, co-founder and partner of the Justice Law Collaborative. Kim, welcome, thank you for being here. And we have your testimony on our webpage, so we will uh, follow along. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and then we'll, we'll listen. Thank you, Senator Lyons. And thank you also to the Senate committees on Judiciary, Health and Welfare and Education. I appreciate everyone who is here today to participate meaningfully in these discussions to unearth what has happened over the past few decades at Kern Hatton. But more importantly, uh, in the interest of rectifying the damage that has been done and ensuring that children are protected in the future. I, we, we did hear those questions from the senators and we appreciate those questions because that's really truly what this is about. Uh, this is about children. Children are a blessing and a privilege. Many of us feel that way who have our own and to have them in our care is also a blessing and a privilege. We also know that when they're young, they're in their most, most formidable years and that they're vulnerable and that they need guidance and protection and safeguards. And with that means that the caregivers are critically uh, important to their development and their welfare in the future. It's unfortunate that we are here today to talk about decades of horrific abuse that occurred at Kern Hatton Homes for Children. It's, it's truly tragic and heartbreaking to hear the stories and the testimonials of uh, the many, many people that I currently represent. Uh, we represent approximately 30, four people who uh, range in the ages of 11 years old to 80 years old, who suffered tragically while they were in the care of Kern Hatton. The abuse as we put forth in our testimony and as I will present today is well documented, not just through their testimonials, but also in the most more recent years through the records from the Department of Children and Family Services and also the Vermont State Police Department. Now, we don't have to be experts to understand childhood trauma and the long lasting effects that it has, but I will also share some information on that as well. Having a master's in social work, I also have a lot of experience in that area. And back in the 1990s, I actually worked in the child protection unit in the Manhattan family court system as a social worker with lawyers. Uh, and I think it's important for us all to understand uh, what this type of trauma and the effect this type of trauma has on people. Uh, I appreciate that everyone is here today to hear from me. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here on behalf of all the survivors. We thank you very much. From our uh, viewpoint, the uh, inadequacies and the failures uh, that we will set forth today um, are, are tragic and they've permeated this institution for decades. And today we believe it's now time for action we need immediate action to provide some sense of justice to not only the survivors, but also to ensure that children are currently in the care of Kern Hatton are protected from harm. And I just wanna recognize before I start to present um, and acknowledge and appreciate the questions that the senators are asking of the Agency of Education, of the Department of Children and Welfare, and of all the people that hopefully will be discussed and questioned in the future. As we unravel and we look at how we can remedy in this, this issue, and we have to acknowledge that it went on for so long, it went on for decades, and that many people at Kern Hatton and also other state agencies and elsewhere failed children for years. I thank you for being the first people to give these survivors a sense that they won't be failed in the future. And now if I could share my screen I think Nellie will give me permission. You should have that ability already. Okay. Apologies for the technological delay. I think I have it here now. <clears throat> Is the screen visible? 
Uh, yes, it is. Uh, thank you. And uh, Kim, uh, just just so you know, we're we're slightly behind schedule, given our late beginning uh, at at nine and a little after nine. So um, any consolidation that you can do would be extremely helpful. All right, we'll definitely do that. And this is available also um, to the senators, and I believe it's going to be uploaded on the web page, so you can look at it. And if anyone has any further questions, they can let me know um, afterwards. I just was going to have it. We do have it on our web page, and uh, we can see it on screen. It's good. Okay, great. Thank you. And if you have any questions, and you please feel free to interrupt me along the way. Um, the testimonial evidence is what we have from back in the 50s, uh, the 60s, and the 70s. Um, as you can see here, we've put forth some information regarding multiple issues of, of abuse, broken bones, neglect, not bringing children to hospitals, allowing them to go with broken bones and ear infections so long that they have incurable scarring. Um, we continue to see in the beginning a uh, history of sexual molestation. These are staff members. Um, some of the executive directors in the past and house parents in the 60s were molesting some of the children there. Um, there were torturous routines of exercise. There were incidents of children being left outside in the cold, freezing without a coat until they fell unconscious in the snow. Um, there are multiple issues of feeding children um, sumac, making children re-eat their own vomit, um, and also um, uh, provide, not providing them any, any food at all if uh, there were some punishments. These are the sort of things that were happening and are reported um, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, as we get into the 80s, we finally have some documentation of what was happening there. Um, there was the continuation of the same type of neglect, of, of physical abuse, of emotional abuse, and also of sexual misconduct. Um, it, these are instances here where we've set forth various pieces of this timeline where there was a 12-year-old that was repeatedly raped by a Kernhattan staff member. The issue here is that notice was provided to Kernhattan related to this. It was observed. And instead of helping this young girl, they brought her to an OBGYN to fit her for a diaphragm, allowing the 26-year-old staff member to continue to repeatedly rape her. And then upon graduation, gave her birth control pills. Um, we then go on and see six -year -old girl, a six-year-old girl who was sexually assaulted by older peers. Um, by sticking Barbie doll legs in her vagina and in her anus. Um, again, we'll see a, a theme here when we see the peer on peer abuse, that it is an issue of lack of supervision that's happening at Kernhattan and also inappropriate aging of people within the cottages and allowing access of 14 year olds to six year olds. And, and I think I, it goes without saying that Sexual conduct is not something that's normal for a six, seven, eight, nine-year-old. That's not something they are aware of. They are immature. They, they learn these types of behaviors from others. And that is one of the main issues that's troubled Kernhattan for decades, the lack of supervision and putting children in inappropriate situations with older children. Um, where they have access. And you all probably are well familiar with the Mark Davis error. Uh, Mark Davis was actually a, let me go to this one slide here. So when we go, I wanna go back before the Mark Davis error and talk here in 1984, this is where we first start seeing DCF notice um, and note the multiple uh, issues and violations and non-compliance issues that are happening at Kernhattan. Um, it's talking about one, child abuse, two, inappropriate physical intervention, three, the use in a child care capacity of adult who are not subject to Kernhattan's policies, meaning I think at one point in time there were house husbands of house parents who were physically aggressive and using firearms around the children. Um, there's a continuation of the staff who previous actions suggest an inability to adequately perform their child care services. So meaning they're continuing to have uh, staff members on that are not appropriate or trained appropriately. And this document goes on to talk about the lack of, of sufficient training 
and also the lack of formal staff evaluations. And this goes back to the 1980s. You'll see there's a consistent um, sort of theme here throughout where uh, these are issues that are not rectified by Kern Hatton. And as I mentioned, we, we're well familiar probably with the Mark Davis years. He uh, was found guilty of molesting multiple boys. The allegations, I believe, were up to 14 different children. Um, he would go into their rooms. He would uh, drug them at night, some of them, um, some of them not. He would go in and push their faces into a pillow and forcibly rape them and sodomize them. Uh, he interestingly was fired from, or well, he was allowed to be let go from Kern Hatton before these sexual assaults took place. In December of 1988, he was uh, allowed to uh, resign from Kern Hatton after being allegations of serious physical abuse. Well, just six months later, he's back on the premises as a substitute house parent and a spouse of a house parent and a substitute staff member going on to rape and molest at least 14 boys. So in 1989, DCF starts to notice also that students were routinely being isolated for long periods of time. At that point in time, the uh, policies in place were to only allow 30 minutes of isolation. These children were being locked in their rooms for over a day and not allowed out until it was time for dinner. So DCF is noting those issues. Here's the police report related to Mark Davis. And um, actually I misspoke, it's 17 boys who were uh, accused him of touching him. And we know of some of our clients who, while they were molested, denied it to the police. So we believe that number is an underestimation of what happened. Now in the 1990s, the abuse continues. The physical abuse continues to be perpetrated. Children are forcibly put again into solitary confinement for hours. They're not given food. There's no natural sunlight. There are other house parents again that are molesting children, forcing them to perform sexual acts. There's inappropriate aging lack of supervision, uh, peer on peer abuse is continuing to be rampant with older children uh, manipulating and uh, teaching, I would say younger children. And that, that's where this generation of uh, sexual assault continues to become a cycle. Um, it's been happening since the 50s. It's continuing to happen now into the 90s and into the 2000s. Um, there are DCF notations of issues with peer-on-peer -peer sexual relations. There's issues again noted by DCF about the isolation techniques, but again, no action is taken and their approval, their conditional approval continues. And they are, continue to be a school that, that has children there. Now in the 2000s to 2009, again, staff were regularly beating children. There were notations of choking them. Children were sexually um, molested and again, sodomized by peers in the reports, the DCF reports, which we cite in our letter in our papers show that um, there were issues with Kern Hatton documenting the physical abuse, that there were issues with them reporting it and that, that these issues were also being ignored by the house parents who were well aware of them. Now, as we get into the into 2010 and 2015, this is where we really see a lot more documentation um, of, of all of the abuse in addition to the testimonial issues that we see. Um, there's again, an issue here in the early 2000s of a nine-year-old in a cottage with a 13-year-old who was sodomized and forced to perform sexual acts. The student ran away from home multiple times and uh, because of this abuse, and the police reports launched in 2018, essentially said there's nothing we can do because they're both minors. So again, we see DCF documenting things. We see the Vermont State Police documenting things, but nobody taking any action, including Kern Hatton. So in 2015, there's again issues of forced rape, forced sex. We have these documented now, well documented in the record. Nothing happened there. Unfortunately, nothing happened. Um, and again, we have continuous physical abuse, house parents shaking and grabbing children. 
students being molested and raped by peers again a female uh, student who was assaulted multiple times by another student who she was placed in the room with um, there were issues with the executive director's son specifically soliciting nude photos from younger girls and uh, sorry it's asking me to admit someone i think nelly are you admitting that person I think Nellie may have admitted someone. Sorry about that, for that interruption. So this is the document related to uh, the foster son of the executive director um, seeking nude photos from 12 year olds um, and attempting to get other nude photos of another 13 year old. Um, he was allowed continued access despite these issues being raised um, while he was working in the capacity as in a caf as a cafeteria worker um, and allowed contact continuously with these girls to continue to harass them for nude photos again nothing was done about this um, when we get into uh, 2017 this is where a lot of these issues with the touching club become aware the Touching Club, as you all probably know, um, has gone on for multiple years. We'll get into some documents related to that. Again, cyclical peer upon peer abuse that was never stopped, was learned from the assaults they were, they were uh, being subject to by staff members and then continuing to be taught to children. Here's one issue that um, was noted in a DCF record where there was one peer who would insert a toothbrush into the other peer's vagina. Um, she basically was able to do this for two years straight. They, allowed, they were clearly unsupervised. Um, this continued to happen. The girls were so afraid to report it because the girl told them that she would kill them in their sleep with a knife if she did. So this is more of the uh, documentation. This is from the police report regarding that uh, toothbrush issues and that it was happening in private areas and bathrooms and bedrooms. Again, there's another issue here that we see documented that these were not reported timely. That um, these were told to Nancy Richardson back in February and the report didn't happen until April. And she's quoted by DCF as saying, I just figured that's what girls do. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of girls forcing masturbation with a toothbrush on another girl and saying, I will kill you with a knife in your sleep if you tell anyone. That is just unheard of. I think we've got another admission issue, Nellie, someone trying to get in. Uh, Kim, Kim, we're okay, uh, and okay. We're, we're taking care of it. Don't, don't even, don't even worry about it. We're all set. Okay. Anytime I am not able to move the slide, I assume that's the issue. Sorry. About yeah. No, it, we did. We we allowed uh, some a sender back in, but you're okay. okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, uh, it's kind of sometimes it's good to have an interruption from these documents anyway, and I, I recognize how difficult it is to see this and. You know, it's very triggering. So if anyone needs a break too and needs me to pause, please let me know. Um, this is additional documentation of boy on boy assault. And again, another boy on a older boy on a younger boy, um, forcing him in the bathroom uh, to be anally raped. This boy actually yelled and screamed, but yet no one came. Um, if there was adequate supervision, perhaps that abuse wouldn't have continued on for two years. Um, this boy did try to act out and tried to tell people that um, he was being harmed. And, and interestingly, in this case, the person who was molesting him had already been identified by Kern Hatton earlier that year in 2016 as having propensities for sexual uh, misconduct. Well, rather than removing the kid from the facility, they put him in our client's bedroom um, and allowed him to continue to have access to, to abuse and assault multiple other children and multiple other boys. Um, and in this instance, the house parents also, when interviewed by DCF, acknowledged that they were aware of the perpetrator 
acting out specifically so that he could be at the same bedtime as our client. So it, it was clear that there was knowledge going on here at Kernhatton for multiple years of this type of abuse and people not doing anything to stop it. So finally, in 2019, DCF starts to scrutinize the uh, more of the residential treatment facility piece of, of Kernhatton than anything, but perhaps that's where we finally see some, some action and documentation actually resulting in uh, more investigation here. Um, so the report that they released details dozens of instances of sexual abuse and neglect. It also uh, indicates that there are multiple issues with this touching club where children are being forcibly molested. Um, also um, inappropriate provision of medication by house parents. This is a very lengthy report. I would encourage everyone to read it if you haven't had a chance to already. But here are some highlights that we pulled of it. Again, failing to report. 12, 17 child abuse regulatory interventions took place at least three were not reported in the required time frame. Then it goes on to talk about their, their system in 2015 that they put in place for incident reports. And then at least 10 of those should have been reported, but they were not reported. This is how the cycle of abuse continues. There's a report again of a female student and, and multiple students between the ages of six to 12 that are coerced to prov provide sexual acts. Lack of supervision, this is where it happens. You'll see if you look at these documents, stairwells, bathrooms, auditoriums, all these places in the bushes outside, no one's watching what's happening. And that's why this continues to happen. Um, so this is documented by DCF. It goes on. Um, again, no staff in the hallways, happened when they were sleeping, multiple instances of sexual assault, peer on peer. Again, we see here the age difference, the older children who are perpetrating on the younger children. So then the touching club is also identified by DCF. One of their own internal staff members, Carrie Newton, wrote this piece of the report in their minute notes that we were able to access. She said, this is an issue that's becoming systemic and that it's directly attributable to the lack of follow through and bad judgment calls of the administration. She was adamant that Steve Harrison and Sue Kessler know of these incidents and concerns. This is a problem. This is someone internal. She goes on to talk about the concerns that the director of counseling Christine Reed has as to the inaccurate information that Kern Hatton is putting in the incident reports concerning the touching club. Um, that they did not explain the sexualized behavior in those reports. And again, Nancy Richardson just allowed one of these perpetrators to remain on campus for another four days because she forgot about them. What happened during those four days to other children? So I put together these two slides just to kind of take a snapshot of years and years and years of non-compliance and violations that were occurring at Kern Hatton to query, why didn't anything happen? You know, in the words of one of our clients, why didn't anyone notice? So, you know, you see this year after year after year, non-compliance, violation of regulations, but they continue to have condition, they continue to have conditional approval and house 120 students. Then into the 2000s, I, I kind of just had to cut to 2015 forward. And this isn't even all of the incidents. These are just the highlights of the incidents. You know, I just have to ask her, it begs, it begs the question, why did DCF or the Vermont State Police not do more? Why didn't Kern Hatton do something about this? Um, why did it have to take survivors coming forward for anyone to act? Because that's truly what happened. When survivors got brave enough to speak about these incidents, finally something started to happen. So I'd like to turn to the effects of trauma. Um, these are just some statements that we've heard 
from our clients. I went there a troubled kid and came out broken. I could hardly breathe. I was in a panic. There was no safe place. There was no place I could be okay. Nobody ever protected me. They all got away with it for so many years. They all knew there isn't a piece of me that doesn't believe that. My friend committed suicide as a result of the abuse at Kern Hatton. I'm his voice now. And now that all the others who can't speak for themselves, I'm their voice. We can't prevent what happened to us, to the rest of us, but we can make sure going forward, nothing happens to them. The cycle of abuse must be broken, but before that can happen, Kern Hatton needs to acknowledge its role in it and stop denying it. I will quickly go through these slides. I'm sure you all can spend time on these later if you wanna know a little bit more about the effects of uh, childhood abuse um, on people into the future, but it affects everything from cognition, physical health, emotions, relationships, mental health, behavior, and brain development. You can see here, these are studies literally on how abuse and trauma affects parts of the brain and how the neurons that are under toxic stress become damaged. And these, again, a reminder of like, this is, this is the time when their brains are developing and they're so young. Um, and these will have long lasting effects on their life. And betrayal trauma is one of the things that that's, makes this so much more difficult for um, these survivors. Um, a, betrayal trauma occurs when the people or institutions on which a person depends for survival significantly violate that person's trust and well being. Childhood physical, emotional, and sexual abuse perpetrated by a caregiver are examples of betrayal trauma. Not only were they being abused, but nothing was being done about it. There was an absolute lack of response by Kern Hatton or any other agency or person. And that is what makes this even more difficult because nobody helped them and they were the most vulnerable. But now's the chance. You senators have given them a chance. You've given them an opportunity to be heard through me and I thank you very much for that. And we talk about the cycle of abuse. I just wanna read this quote, never underestimate a cycle breaker. Not only did they experience years of generational trauma, but they stood in face of the trauma and fought to say, this ends with me. This is brave, this is powerful. This comes at significant cost. Never underestimate a cycle breaker. These survivors are cycle breakers. You as senators being involved here are supporting breaking this cycle of abuse at Kern Hatton. And we thank you very much for that. And we have lots of ideas to share with you as to how things can be rectified the types of policy changes that need to take place and the various uh, ramifications and reform that needs to happen in order for Kern Hatton to proceed under its current mission of safeguarding children. We uh, welcome any questions that you have and welcome the opportunity to provide you further thoughts regarding that reform and what needs to happen in order for Kern Hatton to be that safe place for children in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say it would be good to take your screen down so we can see one another. Um, so I'll open it up to um, Senator Sears and Senator Campion first. Any questions that you might have of Kim? Go ahead, Senator Sears. Well, uh, Kim asked the question, and so um, why didn't DCF or the Vermont State Police do more? That's certainly part of our job to find out why they didn't do more. Um, but I'm curious if you're working in tandem with the Wyndham County State's Attorney's Office on any of these allegations, which are criminal in nature. Um, certainly many of them are. Um, and uh, so I'm just curious if you know whether that's going on. 
Um, I have worked, we've been working specifically as of late with the New Hampshire detective on the Mark Davis matter. Um, that has been one of the priorities for the criminal investigation because in, in the next month, he will receive a plea deal and the more evidence that they have against him in the new charges of, of uh, possession of child pornography um, is been critically important for us to be able to provide information. Our clients are reviewing sanitized photographs to see if in fact they are in those photographs or they can identify the other children that are in those photographs to see if they can continue to get uh, more jail time on that plea bargain. Um, we have reached out in the past um, to the Wyndham County folks and haven't heard much about it. We, I can tell you we all are we also are working with the agency um, of education in the investigation that they're doing. Um, clients of ours have provided testimony um, and documents to the agency in their investigation. Um, and we're also working with Kernhattan's um, independent investigators and providing testimony and documents to them as well. Criminally, we would love to see something more happen. Um, and uh, if, if in fact that does, we will continue to cooperate and provide as much information as we can uh, to ensure that the Wyndham County uh, AG's office and the DA's office have everything they need to <laughs> fully move forward with any investigation. Thank you, but um, I, I think um, we need to talk about next steps, but one of the next steps needs to have the Department of Public Safety the Attorney General's office and the state's attorneys to the discussion where. Um, as far as DCF goes, I'm, it's not clear to me um, and DOE, and that's why I asked the question about mandatory reports, that um, those situations, were, how they were dealt with, and it's continued to be, it appears from your documents going way back to the 50s, um, when um, that it's continued to not be reported that uh, even when cases were known, there wasn't any report of them. Is that what you're finding in your research on these cases? There yeah. may have been internal reports at Kern Hatton um, and Kern Han Hurton, excuse me, Kern Hatton handled them internally, but didn't go outside either to the licensing agencies, the Vermont State Police or any other group. That's correct. And and some of the older um, time frame, we, we've gotten testimonials that, you know, the physical abuse that resulted in broken bones and injuries and things were dealt with internally at their infirmary and never uh, brought to light any other way, shape or form. Uh, we also know in the 80s, we have a client who would uh, literally tie his sheets together with the other boys before Mark Davis would come in their room. And they knew the time when they turned out the light and how much time they had to get out that window and tie those sheets together to get away. And they would run away and they would be, they would be picked up by state troopers. And usually it was the same state trooper and that trooper would bring them right back to Kern Hatton where they would be beaten for leaving. Um, why didn't that state trooper, you know, do something more? But yeah, I mean, the, the, our understanding is the, not only do the documents support, but our clients' testimony support that much of this was known and not reported. Well, so, uh, yeah, the, go ahead, Senator. I, I, well, I, I was merely going to respond that um, it would be interesting to know, but I, I believe the state police were acting as they would and, and Kern Hatton acted as, in lieu of parents. So they would be returning the child to the parents, whether it was a runaway from home or a runaway from another type of program. State police would be returning them, but why there wasn't any investigation that I'm sure kids said something about why there was all of those right. details. But I, I, yeah, I a, do think did. that explains why they would bring them back. Mm -hmm. We did reach out to uh, Vermont State Police and certainly um, going forward, that will be something that uh, in particular judiciary will want to do. Um, but, uh, and also understanding that some of the, as we heard from DCF, some of the 
reporting becomes confidential and that becomes a significant issue when we try to understand historically the what's happened with the school itself and and as a treatment center so we have um we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, senator campion uh, any question no i i just want to thank uh, ms dowdy um for that timeline and, and history and uh no questions at this time you're very welcome thank you very much it, it is it, it is absolutely um difficult uh, and concerning just to use uh, it is extremely difficult i think for us to hear this uh abuse uh for uh, that happened to children it, it's very sad and uh, so, but thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. And, and, and again, thank you for, for being there to support the children and figure out how to rectify the situation and ensure it doesn't happen in the future. This is where well, the I think, happen, so thank you. Yes, thank you. And you know, as Senator Sears said in the beginning, and I think it's important that we reiterate this, we're not a court, we're not a jury. Uh, but we are here to evaluate our current process, processes, our current statutes, and to determine how to make improvements through um, Agency of Education, Department of Children and Families, uh, judicial or other procedures uh, within the judiciary uh, or state police areas. And as we go forward, that, that's exactly what uh, we will be doing. Uh, and, but we will very definitely uh, ask you to stay available to our committees as we go forward. Absolutely. A Thank as you. we have with our agencies. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so I think we should move ahead with to um, Steve Harrison, who is here. He is the executive director of Kern Hatton. And Steve, thank you for being here. Uh, we, uh, I don't think we have anything from you uh, in written testimony on our web page. But, and it, but if you do have something, um, do you? I, I have. I, I do have some prepared remarks that I'll that I'll be um, starting with, and uh, those will be shared with you all as well uh, after after the fact. I did want to kind of hear uh, the testimony that was coming forward beforehand. Um, again, good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Harrison, and I'm the executive director at Kern Hatton Homes for Children. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today, uh, and I do have some prepared testimony or uh, remarks uh, to start off with, if that's okay. Um, Please. Uh, I will acknowledge that it's difficult to hear uh, the presentation by Ms. Doherty, and I'll speak to that in, in a moment after my prepared remarks, um, as well as, as uh, to any questions that you might have. Uh, uh, regarding her testimony or uh, that from DCF or AOE to clarify situations. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, of serving as, as the executive director at Kern Hatton Homes for five and a half years since 2015. Uh, and in that time, I've seen our staff teach and care for children as if they were their own. And we take their um, uh, role in the lives of our children extremely seriously. Uh, I'd like you to know that, that we appreciate the AOE's decision to conduct a full and fair review, uh, particularly Chair Carroll's indications that the State Board recognizes, quote, that Kern Hatton's 125-year history of, of service to youngsters in need, and that they'll undertake the discussion in a manner that's respectful and fact-finding, fact-based, always keeping foremost the best interests of the children, unquote. We look forward to continuing to cooperate fully. Uh, and to addressing any concerns that the Agency of Education has or anyone else. Uh, we've been transparent in our cooperation with the AOE and its review. However, um, I, I would like to, to uh, mention that it is our understanding that this is a confidential process, uh, the AOE investigation, uh, as, as uh, uh, Council Summons had, had mentioned. So there may be some questions you have today that I may not be able to answer as a result of that. I'm also um, personally unable to address a, a lot of questions regarding the allegations that involve the ongoing litigation that Ms. Doherty just talked about. Um, that's 
still uh, a confidential independent investigation of those claims, which is currently underway. And I'm um, uh, at a loss as to how and why those uh, were not um, held under that confidentiality agreement today. Having said that, I would like to tell you a little bit about Kern Hatton Homes. Um, we operate a residential school located on a 280 acre campus in Westminster, Vermont. And we have done this for over four, 125 years. Kern Hatton has served children ages five to 15 whose families are experiencing a period of need or a period of instability in their lives. Uh, we currently provide children a safe, caring, and, and even a fun environment where they can excel academically, they can grow as individuals, and they can truly experience the joy of childhood. Kern Hatton Homes is a charitable organization with approximately 95% of our school's funding coming from charitable contributions from outside supporters and alumni. We're on a very solid financial footing at the present time, and the Holmes families pay little or nothing to have their children attend here. Um, we operate an approved elementary and middle school academic program with only one state tuition funded student this year with a remarkably low student to teacher ratio of, of six to one. Students are provided with individualized support to meet each child's needs in a complete academic program. But we also include art, music and physical education in that program. In addition, we have numerous extracurricular activities, including band, choir, horseback riding, arts and crafts, and interscholastic and intramural sports. In addition to the academic buildings, the campus includes nine residential cottages, a working farm, therapeutic equestrian center, and athletic facilities. Children come to Kern Hatton Homes from um, Vermont, New Hampshire, and throughout the Northeast. Currently, we have 39 students from Vermont, 18 students, I believe, from, from New Hampshire, and about three from New York uh, at the present time. Referrals come to us from a variety of sources, including many from former children and their families whose lives have been positively transformed by their experiences at Kern Hatton Homes. I want to provide you some direct factual information regarding enrollment. Prior to 2018, the homes typically served approximately 100 children at a time. Um, Ms. Doherty mentioned 120. Uh, I don't know that we've ever been to 120, but certainly in my time here, we've only been up to around 100. In 2018, that number was reduced to approximately 80 children at the suggestion of DCF in order to lower the number of children supervised by the house parents in each cottage. Currently, in response to concerns about the pandemic and after further consideration of the best child to staff ratio, both residentially and academically, Kern Hatton Homes has further reduced its population to approximately 60 children. Post pandemic, we anticipate a census of around 60 to 70 children. That would be about 50 to 60 residential and about 10 day students. Over the past several years, our organization has worked very hard to enhance its academic programs. Kern Hatton Homes is a recognized PBIS, which is a positive behavioral interventions and support school at the tier two level and has been since 2017. We utilize PBIS as an umbrella program for school culture, community and student conduct. The primary focus of PBIS is creating and maintaining a positive school culture and climate. And in 2019, we were recognized as a PBIS School of Merit for implementation with faithfulness to mission, conduct referral declines, and an improvement in standardized test scores. Kern Hatton Homes was the only independent school in Vermont to achieve the merit school status with Vermont PBIS. In addition to being an approved independent school by Vermont Agency of Education, and the only independent school in Vermont to achieve that merit school status with Vermont PBIS, Kern Hatton Homes is close to acquiring accreditation by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, or NEASC, as was mentioned earlier. Having already been favorably rated or rated favorably by a five-member visiting team in the fall of 2019 prior to the pandemic, 
This team spent three days on campus talking essentially to every staff member, uh, interviewing children and reviewing all of our, our facilities and procedures. That accreditation process was put on hold last summer until after the home's legal situation has been resolved per NEASC regulations. Additionally, Kern Hatton had been licensed by DCF as a residential treatment program, as you know, as you heard. However, we focus on providing housing and education and not treatment. And that has been our situation for the last several years. We had begun the process of winding down our license um, over two years ago. Uh, we spoke with the previous RLSI director um, in, in Ms. Benedict's role uh, prior to her arrival, talking about whether or not we wanted to maintain our license because we really weren't providing treatment to children. That was not the role and the function and, and what was happening at Kern Hatton Homes. We were actually providing education and a caring place for children to live more in terms of a boarding school as opposed to a treatment residential treatment program facility. We had begun the process of winding down our license nearly two years ago, and it was our announcement to DCF that they asked for in September of 2019 uh, of our readiness to end the license that prompted DCF to conduct its final licensing review. They didn't conduct the final licensing review because of abuse allegations, but rather because we had notified them that we were planning on relinquishing our license. At the time, they supported that transition, uh, and there's documentation in the public record to show this. And even up until the January, excuse me, the June 25th, 2020 final letter that they gave us, listing out the terms of the actual um, five elements to relinquish our license, they were still stating to us that they would be willing to work with us and continue to have us as an RTP. Kernhattan Homes has also made substantial improvements to our residential program, including the hiring of a new director of residential services in January of 2020, who brought more than 25 years of experience as a residential professional to the program, and who has overseen significant enhancements in all areas of residential life. Additionally, changes in the structure of our counseling and health services departments have occurred to ensure that nurses and counselors are now available during the afternoon and evening hours, which has strengthened the support provided for children each day. Staff to child ratios have been lowered significantly. We've had extensive staff training, including weekly staff meetings with ongoing training opportunities. And our staff has attended our annual conference each October for excellent professional development by top professionals in the field. I do want to close by saying that we have heard from countless former students and families about the incredible positive difference that Kern Hatton had on their lives. I understand the pain that Ms. Doherty referred to from her clients, and we want to be sensitive to that. We want to be open to that. We want to, to recognize that we're moving in a direction of trying to, to hear what they have to say and rectify any of their concerns. I do encourage any legislator or any agency official at any time to come to Kern Hatton and spend as much time as you would like, subject to COVID restrictions, of course, but you can come to see our operations. You can come to see our wonderful staff in action. You can come to see the quality care that is being provided for our children. It is an open environment and I welcome you to come to campus and view for yourself the good work that we're doing for our children here. I thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and I'm open to any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, before, before we go to Senator Sears, I'm, um, I've had a request, uh, and I agree uh, from uh, Kim Dougherty to respond to one of your comments, um, Mr. Harrison. So, uh, Kim. Thank you. I, I just want to assure Mr. Harrison and the senators that, that nothing in my presentation was subject to any confidentiality. Um, per the senator's request of me last Friday, I prepared a timeline of the 
uh, abuse that is set forth in documents that were provided to us through a public record request, through a FOIA request. We have not revealed any confidential information related to any investigations to the senators whatsoever, and we don't intend to do so. We take our responsibilities to confidentiality very seriously and we'll continue to do so. All right, thank you. Uh, I thought uh, I think it was important for senators to hear that clarification. Um, I, I do want to ask one question and I'm going to have Senator Sears and Senator Camp Campion ask their questions as well. Um, but uh, Mr. Harrison, you have now been at the school since uh, 2015 and that you're talking about changes that have started um, I believe you said somewhere around 2019 or 2020, uh, even with an ongoing, uh, ongoing concerns about abuse at the school. So I guess my question of you is how much of the change that you are, have put in place and are working on is a result of the investigation or the um, sort of the, the visibility of uh, issues related to the school, sort of the coverage that we've seen in the press and how much of it is related to your internal knowledge about what's needed at the school. Thank you for that question and I appreciate the opportunity to respond to it. We've been making changes since I came in the door. Um, we recognized that there were that there were needs in our residential program and throughout our, our, our program overall. We can always improve in, in what we're doing. Um, We've, we've made changes throughout the time that I've been here, uh, but we did institute a number of changes in 2019 and on into 2020 that uh, reflect uh, uh, concerns that came to us from DCF. And so the specific concerns that you're talking about uh, that were relayed in the December 2019 report, licensing report from DCF, um, prompted us to, to continue on with some of those changes, but they weren't the, the uh, only initiative or only prompt for, uh, for the changes that we were making. All right, thank you. Um, Senator Sears. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, Why don't you go to Senator Campion? I'll try to get the dog under control. That's part of Zoom from home. Okay. Okay. Uh, Senator, Senator Lyons. Campion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Lyons. I think my uh, main question has to do with uh, a little. I'd like to know how you train teachers and staff to be mandatory reporters. I'd like to know about that training. And then I'd like to know the process that you go through when someone does report, uh, uh, you know, cites an incident. Um, and then finally, I think I'd be interested in knowing, you know, the, whether or not you do exit interviews uh, and what, and if those exit interviews, when people do decide to leave, if those have had anything to do with uh, abuse. So training of teachers and staff about mandatory reporting what the process is when an incident is uh, is uh, noted, and then um, a sense of, or more than a sense, but have you received either complaints of abuse since you've become the head of school, uh, either uh, you know through a, a student family member or also during the exit interview process? I think I can talk uh, fairly freely about the actual process. I do have to say that, that some of this may come under the confines of the AOE investigation. And so I have to be a little bit constrained in terms of the confidentiality there. And uh, contrary to what um, uh, Ms. Doherty did say, uh, we do feel like we're con constrained uh, somewhat by the confidentiality agreements that we all signed regarding the independent investigation. Uh, so there may be some areas there that I may not be able to go into at all as well. But regarding the questions that you're asking about, in terms of our training, we start off the year uh, with a, a five-day uh, uh, training session for all of our staff. Uh, some of it, it's department by department, and some of it is an all-staff training. And in that period of time, we go through training on mandatory uh, mandated reporting. 
and um, uh, hazing, harassment, and 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 uh, bullying kinds of training as well. All kinds of training, but but it's a it, it is an extensive training that goes on during the course of our five day uh, initial training, and then throughout the course of the year, we have uh, uh, at least one, if not two or three, um, actual professional development days uh, in which we oftentimes will incorporate uh, aspects of mandatory uh, reporter training as well as other aspects of, of reporting that goes on through the course of the year. We do have uh, an annual conference that we hold on campus each year in October and all of our staff have been participating in that conference which brings in uh, experts from around, um, um, around the region and around the, the country actually to speak to folks here in um, the New England region about specific uh, aspects of their their area of training, whether that's trauma um, induced care or uh, anxiety in children or ADHD or other types of, of aspects. And while that may not be specific mandated reporter training, it does get into the aspects of um, identifying uh, uh, the aspects of, of sexual abuse and sexualized activity in children. Regarding your question about process, I think I can speak to that without too much difficulty. Uh, the process that we have for uh, reporting is that if anybody on campus, whether it's a teacher, a counselor, a house parent, a, a cafeteria worker, or a, um, a, a maintenance worker, hears from a child about any issue, any situation that would cause any suspicion of abuse or, or um, sexualized activity, they are required, and we tell them this in our trainings, they are required to report to uh, DCF within a 24 hour period to centralized intake about that particular situation. Centralized intake uh, and DCF then makes a determination as to whether or not they feel like it warrants being investigated further. Uh, DCF then takes on any of the investigation on those situations um, and have told us over the time that I've been here at least that if we report to centralized intake, we need to allow DCF to take over the investigation and follow up on that and not investigate it ourselves so that we're not muddying the waters or something from their investigation. Uh, what's interesting um, perhaps in, in some respects is that, uh, uh, well, I don't think, actually, I don't think I can go there in terms of the confidentiality agreement, but but some of the, some of the, the um, reports that were shared even by Ms. Um, Doherty had come back to us in results letters stating that they were not substantiated allegations um, from DCF. And so, uh, you know, I'm not saying that nothing happened. I can't get into that because I don't know. But I can say that, that we haven't always um, um, agreed with, with what's come out uh, in, in the media uh, about those specific investigations because the media didn't report the results letters from DCF. Uh, how the media got the actual investigations and the uh, results um, um, of, of those investigations and the reports themselves um, through a FOIA grant or, or request is uh, a, a mystery to us as well because as, as was cited earlier, uh, those types of reports and investigation reports are actually confidential information, whether they have uh, redactions or not. So, uh, so, so, Mr. Harrison, I think uh, we understand now the process and you're starting to move into a debate between different parties. And so I think um, rather than do that, we should uh, see if Senator Campion or Senator Sears have follow up. Well, I just had one follow up. I, I wonder I how, a... how many reports did, have you received of abuse since you were head, since you became head of school? I don't have an exact number because sometimes those reports don't necessarily get uh, reported directly to me or even to the administration. If a staff member goes directly to DCF and makes a, a report to centralized intake, we may or may not receive a specific response on that particular uh, report to us. How many generally, are you? How many? Yes, generally. Generally, I would say we probably had uh, six or seven, uh, maybe eight or nine, possibly in some years, 
um, uh, through the course of a year that have gone on to, to uh, centralized intake for, for investigation. Okay, clarifying, is that annually or is that all together since you've been head of school? It'd probably be about annually, probably six to, six to nine annually that we would have some type of a report that would be going to centralized intake for review. So roughly 45 since you've been head of school. I would say uh, probably around 35, maybe. Thank you. Not all of which have been investigated or accepted as being warranted for investigation. All right, thank you. Um, Senator Sears. Yeah, I, I'm reading a, an article from the uh, Brattleboro Reformer dated July 5th, 2020. Um, and um, it's, uh, written by Bob Adet, Abuse Victims Seek Apology from Kern Hatton is the headline. Mr. Harrison, you're quoted as saying um, in the article, we plan to fully investigate these claims and even though they allegedly happened 30 to 60 years ago, we vow to do all we can to uncover the truth and if need be help survivors find the peace they seek and deserve. Um, we take these allegations extremely seriously and the thought that any of our children who came to us for refuge suffered abuse while in our care is both horrific and heartbreaking. Um, this was in response to a suit regarding Mark Davis from a uh, lawyer named Foote from Pennsylvania. Could you tell us what you've done um, since July 5th uh, to uh, hold up to what you said you would do there? Thank you. We have, uh, that was the independent investigation that I alluded to earlier uh, in terms of the um, uh, remarks from Ms. Doherty. Uh, we- No, I, I did, Mr. Davis, uh, this article is, you, we plan to fully investigate these claim, claims, That's even correct. though it allegedly happened a third to 60 years ago. I'm asking you what you've done since July 5th to cooperate and fully investigate those claims. We have employed a, a, an independent investigator who is going into those specific claims, is investigating and talking to each of the claimants themselves, is following up on all aspects of the um, uh, claims that have come our way, and that, uh, that independent investigation is ongoing at this point. you apologize to the former residents of Kern Hatton who were abused by Mark? Um, Davis? What we're doing is trying to get the, the full extent of, of what the damage was, um, uh, finding out the specific uh, aspects of all of those claims. And uh, once we get that final independent investigator report, we'll be working with all of the claimants and all of the individuals who have come forward <clears throat> to, to try to make some type of restitution in terms of apologies, as well as uh, see where, where else it might take us. So we are in the process of, of trying to do that independent investigation that I talked about in that specific piece. That investigation is ongoing. It takes time. Uh, it has been difficult in this time of COVID for that to, to all occur, but it is ongoing at this point. Thank you. I, I just comment, Madam Chair, that uh, th this is the heart of my difficulty here is Mr. Davis was found guilty um, by a court of criminal acts while he was at Manhattan. Um, so I don't know that those are confidential. They're a public document from the courts and everything that went on there. I don't know what needs to be investigated other than the, the number of kids who may have been abused. Um, now we have another court case and other charges going on regarding pornography that may have may or may not have involved these students. But um, this is difficult. And I will add too, I, I'm still having trouble figuring out this giving up the residential treatment license. Um, and one side says one thing and another side says another. And one is the state of Vermont, the other is Kern Hatton. So um, it, it would be important in my mind anyway to to better understand that um, as well. But I think um, that this is certainly open up, opens up in my mind um, where this uh, 
some of these things about where we need to go in the future. It certainly does, Senator, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, and along the lines of the um, treatment, uh, residential treatment program that was, was originally at Kernhatton or supposed to be at Kernhatton, I'm getting to be, I'm now very unclear about what was there and what support services were available to kids. Obviously you've described the children at your school as needing some stability. They come from, uh, they come from un instability and with uh, needs. Um, and you've said you're providing a school environment, academic environment with extracurricular activities, but I'm, I'm trying to resolve the issue around instability and, and needs for these kids and what kinds of counseling or other services are made available to bring them to a more, if you will, um, a solid place, a stable place in the social environment. Certainly, I understand where you're coming from. I appreciate the question, and I could certainly understand your your confusion, perhaps, uh, in terms of what is. I, I our... don't think I'm confused. I'm concerned about kids. Okay, as are we, ma'am, uh, and I really do appreciate your your question. the The type of children who come to Kernhatton Homes do need stability. They need um, uh, predictability in their lives, and they need care, and they need concern, uh, as well as an education and a, and a quality program. Uh, and those are the things that we provide uh, in spades here. Uh, we have staff who are trained uh, to tr provide the care and the consistency. We have uh, a, a predictable program for the children so that they understand uh, you know, what their life is going to hold through the course of the day. We have counselors who are meeting with children on a regularized basis. Generally, most of our children have, have a once a week session with their counselor. Um, our counseling staff here is, is uh, far and away above what, what most independent schools or, or even and public schools would have uh, in terms of, of uh, the numbers of, of counselors that we have available to our children. Uh, most schools have one or two counselors for two or 300 kids sometimes. And we have three counselors for 60 children at this point. Uh, so uh, moving forward um, uh, with, with the types of, of care that we have for children, um, it, it goes right into trying to maintain uh, opportunities for them to have stable uh, sleep times at night and, and consistent uh, study times and consistent expectations for their academics as they move forward. Um, those are programmatic uh, uh, opportunities for kids and opportunities for our staff to, to interact with children, but they are not treatment. Um, it's not a treatment program and, uh, and the children who come here um, don't require the kind of treatment that they would require if they were going to um, Brattleboro Retreat or to a, a special education school because that's not what we do. It's not who we are. Um, and so, so let me a, ask you. Yes. Let me ask you this question: uh, Are any do any are any of your do any of your students fall on the autism spectrum? Are there are there students who have uh, special needs that we might consider needing an IEP? No, we do not have IEP students here. Some of our students are uh, on 504 plans, which are uh, uh, structured academic plans but we do not have IEP students, nor do we have any special education students here. All right, thank you. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll have to continue this discussion in our committees going forward to fully resolve some of the questions that we have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harrison, for being available to us. As, as we have said previously, this is the beginning for us to try to understand how to improve our regulations, our statutes, and procedures going forward. We're, we're at the tip of a very large iceberg. We understand that. So, um, Thank you very much for you. having me today. I look forward to the opportunity to speak with you more freely after the AOE investigation is, is completed, and even after the independent investigation is completed, so that we can talk 
um, uh, much more freely about all of these situations because I think um, we'd be happy to try and, and, and clarify situations for you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our, we'll, we'll continue our, our, we still have concerns. Just wanna share that with everyone at least. Um, I do, and I think I represent the thinking of others who are here with us. Um, Senator Campion, Senator Sears, uh, any final questions or comments? I don't have any final questions or comments, but I hopefully um, our committees will not be going over the same ground so that we need to coordinate our future actions and it may be need, necessary for um, judiciary and health and welfare to meet jointly in, in the future. That makes a lot of sense. And yes, we'll, I, we'll think I have nothing that. else to add either, except uh, I appreciate you leading this discussion today. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, Senators, uh, the Health and Welfare Committee has a tradition of finishing a little bit early. Um, I am willing to do that now, unless there is a, a significant question of clarification that any um, Senator has at this point. Uh, Senator, if I could just um, make one closing comment, if, if, if the committee would indulge me. <laughs> Please go ahead, Commissioner. So I, I would just like to take a moment um, and recognize the courage that it took for many of the, um, the victims um, that, that Kim identified in her presentation, the courage to come forward and, to, and for many to relive the trauma and the pain of their event and retelling of, of, of their story. And I just want to acknowledge that, 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 that it takes tremendous courage. And, um, and I just wanted to publicly acknowledge that and recognize that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. I think that is um, that that is absolutely true, and I think we all appreciate that um, yeah. courage that these folks have demonstrated. Thank you all for recognizing that. It's part of the healing. Thank you. All right. Um, hearing no further burning questions, I, I want to thank everyone for being so attentive. And uh, I would like to thank you all who have testified here today for your time and your input. Um, obviously, there are significant concerns and questions about children and how we deal with uh, complaints of abuse and neglect. We will move forward with this and we will move forward um, in joint hearings and possibly in separate hearings. But so thank you. And Nellie, we can uh, go off YouTube and end.